Well, this morning, uh, I want to I want to warn you up front. I'm just going to go ahead and give a disclaimer. This is going to be one of the worst sermons you've ever heard. Yeah, you don't seem that surprised, strangely. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's going to be one of the worst sermons that you've ever heard. I feel pretty good about that. Now, that, well, the flip side is, is you're not going to like it, but I'm going to love it, okay? That's kind of the way, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but that's kind of the way it works. And I've told you guys that I am, I'm a big dork in a lot of different areas, and uh, what we're going to talk about today just fits really nicely into that. I'm really interested in this. You're not going to be interested like I am, but you're going to smile, right? And you're going, after we get done, you're going to come up to me and you're going to pat me on the back and you're going to shake my hand and you're going to say, Pastor, great sermon this morning. And I'm going to know you don't mean it and you're going to know you don't mean it, but I'm going to appreciate you for it. Does that sound like a, a plan for today? All right, you guys, again, you seem way too ready to agree to that. It would almost seem like maybe you've done that before. I'm, I'm sure that's not the case. But let's just see. We'll just see. Man, some of you may walk out of here and go, huh. I'm as big a dork as the preacher is when it's all over, and that's probably okay as well. Let's start with a little Bible pop quiz. How about that? We'll start with a quiz, kind of see who our Bible geniuses are this morning. And here's the question I want to ask you. Who is Melchizedek? All right? Let me say that again. In fact, why don't you just say it with me? Let, let me say it first. Melchizedek. Isn't that a cool name? All right, say it for me. Who is Melchizedek. Yeah, you got to kind of get it from deep within your throat when you say it. Here are the possibilities. I'm going to give you four of them. Number one, or A, uh, another name for the devil. That may sound familiar to you. B, an Old Testament king. C, a Roman emperor who reigned from 48 AD to 59 AD. Or D, Gesundheit. All right, it could be any of those four. All right, now let's just take a, a poll, see what you think. Who is Melchizedek? Who, who thinks it's A? Raise your hand. Come on, be proud. It's all right. No big deal. A? Who thinks it's B? Oh, wow. You guys, I'm, I'm impressed. All right, who thinks it's C? And who thinks it's D? Go ahead. Always the smart aleck uh, in, the, in the crowd, and we now know who it is, Maria. All right, good. Well, the answer is, and, and you, guys, you guys all, you did well, the answer is B, an Old Testament king. And obviously, Melchizedek is a name that's probably not very familiar to us. But believe it or not, Melchizedek is one of the most interesting and important figures in all of the Bible. And as unknown as he may be, there's actually enough information and, and theory about him to fill a couple of sermons. So I'm going to have to work really hard to cover as much as I can in the time that I have this morning. And let me start by explaining why I even chose to talk about Melchizedek today. First of all, because in a personal study I'm doing, and in my community group on Sunday morning, and on Wednesday night, we've recently been covering this part of the Old Testament, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in one of those studies, we came across the story of Melchizedek, and it was pretty clear that this was unfamiliar territory for a lot of people. Well, part of my job is to help you learn and understand the parts of the Bible that maybe you've never studied before. Okay, So that's reason number one as to why we're going to talk about this today. Reason number two is that in this particular Bible study group, they challenged me to preach a sermon on Melchizedek and made it clear that they did not think that I could really do it. And so obviously I had to preach on Melchizedek today. We all agree with that, right? Because I, I, I have to be up for the challenge. But, but the real reason that I want to talk about Melchizedek today is that there is, is actually something so amazing and so mind-blowing about his story that it could change the way you look at Scripture for the rest of your life. And that is an opportunity that I just could not pass up on. So, let's take a look at some Scripture that is related to Melchizedek. Let's see if we can really confuse you, and then I'll do my best to unconfuse you, okay, as, as best as I can this morning. The story of Melchizedek begins in Genesis 14. So if you have your Bible, you're welcome to turn there. We're going to hit about three different places real fast, and I'm going to show you the Scripture on the screen. The story in Genesis 14 centers around the first patriarch, Abraham, or Abram, as he's called at this point. 
And just a little bit of review, after Noah's flood, God is searching for a man to build his nation from. He wants to build the nation of Israel. He's looking for a man to start with. And he chooses Abram and his wife Sarah, and he sends them on a journey to find a new land where God is going to give them the land. He's going to give them first a son, and then that son is going to become a family, and then ultimately that family will eventually become the nation of Israel. But first Abram has to settle in the land of Canaan, also known later as the promise land because God had promised it to him. But in this promised land, understand, are already other cities and nations and people groups, many of whom are at war with one another and all of whom worship other gods. Now that's very important. All of these people who already lived in the land, they worshiped other gods. Little G gods, I call them, because they were not the real God. They were not the big God. They were little G gods. So part of Abram's story is his struggle to live in the land without be becoming like the people who already lived there. Well, in Genesis 14, Abram gets caught up in a war between several of the kings in that land. His nephew Lot, it, you may remember some of his story, is taken captive by one of the kings who's at war. And so Abram gathers up his men, he joins forces with some of the opposing kings, and he goes to battle basically to rescue his nephew. All right, And because God is on his side, Abram and his his allies are victorious over the other kings. Well, where we're going to begin reading in Genesis 14, 17, tells the story of what happened just after that victory. Here's what it says, verse 17. After Abram returned from defeating Kurder Leomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. And so basically what's happening is that Abram has played this important role in the military victory and now the kings that he fought beside are all coming out onto the battlefield to sort of honor him for what he has done. He's a foreigner, you guys understand, in the land. He doesn't belong here. So the king of Sodom was one of Abram's allies in the battle. Now you may remember that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were terrible places filled with people who did awful things. And later God destroys those cities, doesn't he, for some of the things that are taking place there. But so joining up with the king of Sodom was kind of sketchy for Abram in the first place. But again, he was trying to rescue his nephew Lot. That's why he did it. So the king of Sodom is the first to honor Abram. But then, in verse 18, we meet our main character. Here's what it says. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High and blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now, that's it as far as Melchizedek goes in Genesis 14. But let me read just a little bit further to kind of complete the story. All right, verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, Creator of heaven and earth. I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you, listen, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. In other words, Abram is saying, look, I am beholden to God. I do not want to be beholden to you. All right, does that make sense? What's happened here? All right, so again, that's it for Melchizedek. That's all we learn about him in Genesis. Uh, there's nothing more about him through the next book of the Bible, Exodus. No mention in Leviticus or Deuteronomy. In fact, Melchizedek isn't even mentioned again until the 19th book of the Bible, the book of Psalms, specifically Psalm 110 and verse 4. Now, Psalm 110 is actually a prophecy. If you want to turn there, Psalm 110 uh, is, a, is basically a prophecy of the coming Messiah. It's a preview of, the, of what and who the Son of God would be and what kind of person the Son of God would be. So in Psalm 110, 1 through 3, God says to the coming Messiah things like, you're going to sit at my right hand until I'm ready to give you victory. And, and he talks about the heavenly armies that the Messiah would one day command. And then in verse 4 he says this, listen. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. He says to the Messiah, you are a priest forever in the order of whom? Melchizedek. He says you're a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, here's what's going on. God is using the Old Testament character Melchizedek to give a preview of the coming Messiah. And that is incredibly important. I mean, he could have picked anybody in the Old Testament 
But he specifically chooses Melchizedek and he says the Messiah is going to be a person like him. Melchizedek is the kind of person that you can compare the Messiah to. And you have to admit that there couldn't be that many people like that, right? Not very many people you could say, now that's kind of how the Messiah is going to be. But Melchizedek was like that. So that's Melchizedek in, in Psalm 110. Then finally, there's one more place. We're in Hebrews now. Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 7, over in the New Testament, all, all the way almost to the end. And let me read to you. I'm just going to pick some passages. Uh, so it's going to be hard for you to follow me. But let me just pick some passages that specifically mention Melchizedek. All right? I, I'm starting in Hebrews 6, verse 19. It says this. Let this sink in now. He says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. For He has become a high priest forever in the order of, say it, Melchizedek. All right. Now to chapter 7, verse 1. This Melchizedek was a king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God. That's incredibly important. He remains a priest forever. And in verse 6, Melchizedek did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Let me go on. Verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people to establish that priesthood, why was there still another need for a priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in that regard, to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. Now I know, hang, just hang tight with me, alright? Your eyes are starting to glaze over. I, I, I get it. I know. This is, I'm telling you, believe it or not, this is so important. Verse 26. This is the last part I'll read. Verse 26 and through 28. Such a high priest, talking about Jesus and Melchizedek, truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people. For he sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> okay, right? I mean, it's a lot. Basically, what the author of Hebrews is trying to communicate is that Jesus is a high priest along the same lines as Melchizedek and then a whole bunch of other confusing stuff. And as I said, there's, a, there's an awful lot to absorb here, and there's a lot to understand about Melchizedek. So here's what I'm going to do, all right, just to make it a little easier on you. I'm just going to try to answer two basic questions this morning about Melchizedek. And, and it's very simple. Here's what they are. Number one, who was he? Okay, write that down if you would. Who was he? Who was Melchizedek? And then number two, why is Melchizedek important to us? I mean, it can't be any simpler than that, right? I mean, that's as basic as it gets. Who was he and why do we care? Who was he and what does it even matter? And I'm telling you, by the time we're finished, you're going to be throwing Melchizedek references into your casual conversations this week. All right? People are going to think you are so smart. Okay? So just, I'm telling you, hang with me here. Let's, let's start with the first question. Number one, who was Melchizedek? And I'm just going to give you some bullet points. Here's what we know. We know that he lived during the same time as, as Abraham. We know that he lived in the land of Canaan. We know that he was the king of Salem. Write that in. That's important. The king of Salem. Now, Salem was another name for Jerusalem. Okay? Later on, it became known as Jerusalem. So, Melchizedek was the king of that city long before it was, became famous as the capital of ancient Israel. Way, way, way before that. Hebrews 7 also points out that the word Salem means peace. 
All right? And that the name Melchizedek actually means righteousness. And so another way to describe Melchizedek would be the king of peace, the king of righteousness. Now, come on, that's a pretty weighty title, is it not? That, I mean, that, that sounds like a pretty big deal. We also know that Melchizedek was a priest of God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, according to Genesis 14, 12. We also know that he was a priest of God Most High. What's incredible about that, what's unusual about that, is that when Abram entered the land of Canaan with all these nations and people groups and their little g-gods, he literally thought that he and his wife Sarah were the only people who believed and worshipped in Jehovah God. Do you get that, how important that is? He goes into this land as a foreigner. He, there's all these people. He assumes none of them worship the same God that he does. But it turns out there was a man, a king, a Jebusite, in other words, not an Israelite who was also a follower of God, the real God, creator of heaven and earth. We also know that Melchizedek was the first recipient of a tithe. Write that word in. He was the first recipient of a tithe. Here's what happened. When Abraham comes off the battlefield and begins meeting with the different kings, starting with the king of Sodom, the first thing that he does is he takes all of the spoils of, of the war, he divides them up, and he presents 10% of everything to Melchizedek, the priest. Now this is amazing, because much, much later, hundreds of years later, when God gives the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law to Israel, He's going to set up a sacrificial system, like we talked about last week during the Lord's Supper, whereby you have one whole tribe, the Levites, who are going to serve as priests. Twelve tribes of Israel, right? One tribe is nothing but priests, the Levites. And once a year, the high priest, as again, as I told you last week, they're going to take an unblemished lamb into the tabernacle or the temple, and they're going to go into the Holy of Holies where the actual presence of God is, and they will sacrifice that lamb for the sins of the people. And because of that, their sins will be forgiven. In fact, in this sacrificial system, that is the only way a person's sin can be forgiven. You need the priest to be an intermediary between you and God. You do not go into the presence of God. Do you understand that? Only the priest can do that for you. So you can see why the priests, the descendants of Levi, would be incredibly important to the people of Israel. Well, one of the things that God said when He set up the law was that the other 11 tribes would own land, they would have possessions, they would get an inheritance, that, that, that all of that would continue on through the generations. But the Levites, the priests, they were not to share in that. Now, listen to this. This is important. The priests were to receive their inheritance and their sustenance only from God. The way God provided for that was the tithe. All of the other 11 tribes were to take what they had, they were to give 10% of everything they owned, everything they earned, everything they grew. The first 10% of that was to be given as an offering to the priests so that they could take care of themselves, their families, the temple, and to be able to provide ministry to the people. And so that's the sacrificial system. That's the priesthood. That's the tithe. But here's the deal. None of that happens until nearly a thousand years after Abraham dies. So do you see how incredible it was that Abraham would give a tithe to God through Melchizedek a thousand years before God even said that you were supposed to do that. It's a big deal. And it's the first example of a tithe that's ever listed in the Bible. A couple of other things we know about Melchizedek. Write this in if you would. Jesus was considered a high priest in the order or in the line of Melchizedek. And this was also a big deal, and here's why. Because Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, not the priestly tribe of Levi. So in Jesus, you have the first priest in the history of Israel since the giving of the law who was not a Levite. So what kind of priest was Jesus? He, it says he was a priest in the line of Melchizedek. Again, that is a big deal. And then finally, I don't want you to miss this because this is really interesting. Apparently, Melchizedek had no parents and he didn't die. Did you pick that up when we read about him? In the Scripture, he had no parents and he didn't die. Now what in the world am I talking about? You're like, wait a second, he's a man. How can that be? Well, let me read again to you from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 3. 
It says this about Melchizedek. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without a beginning of days or an end of life, resembling the Son of God, he, Melchizedek, remains a priest forever. And so clearly this Melchizedek wasn't just your average, everyday, run-of-the-mill human being. He had no mother. He had no father. He had no genealogy. He had no beginning of life. He had no end of life. And he remains a priest forever. You've got to admit, some interesting characteristics about somebody mentioned in the Bible. Alright, so that's some of what we know about Melchizedek. But let's try to answer the other question. Who, uh, we, we asked, who is he? Here's, here's how we answer in the least and in the most. Here's the best answer I can give you. At the least, here's who he is. He's a preview of the Messiah that was to come. Okay, at the very least, we can look at the Bible, we take what it says, and I think we can walk away very confident in knowing that Melchizedek was a preview of the Messiah to come. Uh, Psalm makes it clear there was a comparison to be made between Melchizedek and Jesus the Messiah. Hebrews makes it clear that God used Melchizedek to help us understand who and what Jesus would be. So at the very, very least, He is a supernatural preview of the Messiah that Jesus would one day, thousands of years later, become. That's at the least. But let's talk for a second about the most. All right, I'm going to have you write a word in. It's a crazy word. It may be, it's probably a word you've not heard of. I want you to write in the word Christophany. All right, let me spell it for you. First of all, it's C H R I S T, just like Christ, Christophany, and then O P H A N Y, Christophany. Write that in. And what a Christophany is, is a pre incarnate appearance of Christ. A pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, let's remember a couple of things about Jesus. I think we mostly understand that Jesus, the Son, is one-third of the Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we got that. And we know that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary around the beginning of the first century A.D. We know He lived for 33 years before His death, burial, and resurrection. Again, we know that. I think we got that down. What we may forget is that Jesus the Son existed before Jesus the Man. Are you with me here? Jesus the Son existed before Jesus the Man. Remember that John chapter 1, speaking about Jesus, says this, In the beginning was the Word. And when it says the Word, they're talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. And then verse 14 says, The Word, Jesus, became flesh, and He made His dwelling among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so Jesus, the Son, the Word, He existed with God long before He became flesh and dwelt among men. Remember also that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God was creating the earth and everything in it and on it, God made this statement. Listen to this. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Here's the question, who is this us? Right? Who is this our? Does God have a mouse in His pocket? Who is God talking about besides Himself when He says, Let us make man in our image? I believe He's talking about the Son. I believe he's talking about the Word who would one day be made flesh. So, what does all that have to do with, with this weird word, Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ? Well, here's, here's what it has to do with it. Some Bible scholars, men way smarter than I'll ever dream of being, believe very strongly that Melchizedek, listen, King of Righteousness, the King of Peace, priest of, of God Most High, who had no beginning had no end, will continue as a priest forever, who showed up on the battlefield and blessed Father Abraham and served him and his men a meal of... Anybody remember what he served them? Verse 18, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Okay, so Melchizedek, who served bread and wine. That sound familiar at all? Right? We did last week. We talked about this, right? Melchizedek. 
who Psalms says is a preview of the coming Messiah, and Melchizedek, who Hebrew says resembled the Son of God. Many, many Bible scholars believe that this Melchizedek is actually a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. 2,000 years before Jesus of Nazareth was born. Now how, I mean, just think about that. How amazing is that possibility? Now, notice that I say possibility. Because I cannot tell you for a fact that this is the case. I can show you the evidence that points to it, but I cannot personally guarantee it for you. By the way, did you know that there are other possible Christophanies in the Old Testament? And, by the way, I want you using that word at some point this week. All right? I mean, if you, you throw that word in, people are like, oh my goodness, they're so smart, right? Christophany, I don't even know what it means, but it sounds so smart. This is not the only one. Melchizedek is not the only one. Uh, many scholars believe that the angel, the angel of the Lord, who shows up 59 times in the Old Testament, if you saw, how many of you saw the Bible miniseries this year on the, the History Channel? Back around Easter, right? Great series. A lot of people enjoyed that. The angel of the Lord was the man who would appear and he would remove his red hood in order to speak for God. I don't know if you remember that, but he would show up to Abraham or he would show up to Gideon and, and he would remove his hood and he would speak for God. Many scholars believe that the angel of the Lord is a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. There, there's some really interesting reasons why. That's another sermon for another day. All right, I'll mention one more. If you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Israelite children who were thrown into the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel, you might remember that story from when you were a kid. You might also remember that not only did those three young men not burn up and die, not only did they survive being thrown into the fire, do you remember what happened next? A fourth person appeared in the fire with them. Do you remember that part of the story? Well, again, if you saw the Bible miniseries, it was the same actor who would later play Jesus who was standing with them in the fire. Know why? Because many Bible scholars believe that this was a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Alright, so back to Melchizedek. We have some idea of who he was at the very least. I think very confidently we can say he was a preview of the Messiah. At the most, a Christophany. A, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. But now we need to answer question number two, and really it's the more important question. And that is this. Why is Melchizedek important to us? Why does it matter? What's the takeaway from this story? Wh why does it matter about this Old Testament biblical character? And why does it matter to us today? Let me give you three reasons why it matters to us. And, and I really want to encourage you to write these three things down. First of all, because the story of Melchizedek represented a faith-filled decision by Abraham. One of the first and most important faith-filled decisions that Abraham would make in his life as, as the father of the nation of Israel. Remember that there were two kings who came out on the battlefield that day to honor Abram. Melchizedek and the king of Sodom. From Melchizedek, Abram received a blessing. He allowed him to bless him. And in return, he gave the first biblical tithe, just like we talked about. To the king of Sodom, the king of a famously evil people, Abraham said this, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, Creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. Do you see that in a choice between serving the king of an evil people or, or the priest king of God Most High, Abraham chose Melchizedek. And if you read on in Genesis 15, you're going to find out that Abram was blessed because of that decision. The second reason Melchizedek is important to us is that he helps us better, better understand who and what Jesus is. And again, that's a big deal. He helps us understand who and what Jesus is. In other words, God used Melchizedek to help us get a handle on Jesus, the Messiah. Like Melchizedek, Jesus was both priest and king that would reign forever. Like Melchizedek, Jesus had no beginning. 
And he had no end. Like Melchizedek, Jesus doesn't fit into a box the way that we as humans sometimes try to make him fit. And Melchizedek helps us get a handle on that. And then the final reason that Melchizedek should be important to us is that he is a reminder of the importance of relationship over religion. Now I want you to write that down and then I want you to hear me. If you've been at Oakdale very long or if you are at Oakdale very long, you are going to hear uh, us talk about that idea a lot. We believe that relationship with God trumps religion every single time and every person in here says Amen. Amen. Right? That's why we're here. We believe relationship trumps religion every single time. We believe that what's going on in our heart is more important than anything we can do with our hands or our feet or our mouth. Relationship is more important than religion. Now what do I mean by that in terms of Melchizedek? Well consider this as we close. All right, the, the, We're almost done. You're almost there. You've almost hit the finish line. Okay. The rules said that a priest who could speak on your behalf to God and who could offer up sacrifices on your behalf to God and receive forgiveness for your sin from God, listen, had to be a man from the tribe of Levi. End of discussion. That was the law. That was the rule. And for thousands of years, that's the way they did it. But the Bible says that like Melchizedek, it was Jesus' righteousness and it was His relationship to the Father as the Son that made Him the high priest who would live forever. The Bible says that once Jesus came, we as humans no longer needed a human priest to intercede for us with God because Jesus helped us establish our own relationship with our Heavenly Father. Do you, do you see how big that is? In other words, Melchizedek showed us that it is better to have a high priest who has earned that position. Something, by the way, that none of us could ever do, right? There's no way any of us were going to earn it. But it's better to have a high priest who has earned the position than one who has simply inherited it. Because he happened to be in the right family line and he happened to have the right genealogy and that happened to be what the rules say. And guys, that is relationship over religion. You know what we need to do this morning? Number one, we need to be thankful that God values relationship over religion or there would be maybe one or two people in this entire room who would, be, who would say they were saved and that they are Christians and know for sure they're going to heaven someday when they die. If rules trump relationship, every one of us is in big trouble. But because of what Jesus did and because of how God used Melchizedek to show us what He was going to do, we can know the Heavenly Father. And we do not need anybody, not me, not a priest, we don't need anybody between us and our Heavenly Father. Let's spend some time this morning in prayer. Let's do this. Let us thank God for Melchizedek, for what he represents, for what his story teaches us, and for his connection to the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, let me just start by saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, God, that you value relationship over the rules, over religion. Because God, if it, if it had to be according to the rules, if it had to be according to the law, I would be dead in my sin and I would never have a chance of knowing you because your word says that every single person, everyone who has ever lived, has sinned and fallen short of your glory. And that the wages of sin is death. And that's what the rules would have provided for me. But God, because of your Son, because of Jesus as Savior, as Messiah, your word says the gift of God is eternal life for those who believe. So Father, I stand here today as one who's experienced the rules being marked out 
and saying, you are more important to me than the law. And though you do not deserve it, I will save you. And I will rescue you. And I will redeem you. And I will choose you as my son. And you will spend eternity with me. Now, Father, I know that in my heart. I pray for anybody here who has not known that in their heart, that they would choose today to love You and follow You and serve You and submit their life to You and choose Jesus as Savior. But God, I also pray for myself that I would not waste that incredible relationship that You established with me. That I would live my life right here, right now, and tomorrow, and the day after that, and every day that You give me breath, I would live in such a way that I would please You, that I would honor You as Melchizedek did, and that I might be a preview of Your love for people who do not know You. That is my job. That is what I owe You because of what you've done for me. God, I love you. I love you and I pray and I thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, you agree. I'm a big dork. Amen. But that's a pretty cool story. Isn't it? You know what? Don't ever put God in a box. He will break that box every single time. And as I look around this room, I see people just like me that God broke the box so you could be who He made you to be. We're going to take some time to pray and to sing and to worship and hopefully to respond to what God has said and what He's saying to our heart. Not a lot of time just some time to reflect and to respond to Him. This morning, if, if you're a person, as I mentioned, that maybe hasn't done what we talked about, you've not chosen God as your Father and Jesus as your Savior. You know, I'll be here this morning. I'd love for you to come and, and visit with me about that, either during the invitation time or after the service. I know that there are, uh, there are others this morning who are excited about making decisions for Christ and share those with you. And I encourage you, if, if that's you, do that. Be obedient to that this morning. And meanwhile, each of us, we are responsible to our relationship with God. Let's, let's take steps towards Him right now. All right? Let's stand together. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. We're going to be obedient. I'll be here this morning if you need me. Let's worship Him.
should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mother to bow your heads for just a moment. We're not going to extend this much longer, but let me encourage you just to, to speak and to listen. Can you say thank you to Him? Just for the experience of being with Him today and worshiping with other believers and studying His Word and hopefully being spoken to by Him. Can you say thank you for Melchizedek and what he represents and what he teaches us? And can you ask your Heavenly Father, God, how would you have me to respond right now, tomorrow, and the days and weeks to come? How can I be obedient to you, Father? Father, may we, may we honor You and bless You with our obedience to You. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.